Hello and welcome to Jason's Macintosh Museum. I'm Jason, your host, and what we're looking at today is a Macintosh XL from 1985. Now, I'm sure a lot of you would probably probably be thinking, I've never heard of a Macintosh XL. What is it? And, well, I don't blame you <laughs> for thinking that, because the Macintosh XL was probably one of the rarest, um, shortest-lived and least well-known models of Macintosh ever made. And there are probably others of you who are thinking, that's not a Macintosh XL, that's not a Macintosh at all, that's an Apple Lisa. And that's, your, that's correct as well. This is in fact a version of the Apple Lisa um, computer, but it's also a Macintosh. Now, this is quite an unusual machine in terms of its design um, and the software that it runs, um, because it was never originally intended as a Macintosh, but as we'll discover, it did become one later in its life. Now, because this machine is so different from other models of Macintosh um, that came after it, um, this machine actually predates the, the original Lisa predates the Macintosh, in fact. Because this is so different, we're going to do a, a, um, a special video series on this machine. So there'll be probably four or five videos in the series. Now, the first video will be an introduction to the, the machine. Um, talking about the history of both the Apple Lisa and the Macintosh XL. Then the second video will be the usual um, tour of the machine where we'll look at the outside, look at the inside, and th there'll also be a complete disassembly of the machine so that you can see how these, these computers are disassembled. Then the next video will be a demonstration of the system software and a discussion on that. And then we'll be talking about some of the modifications and upgrades that people have done to these machines to enhance their usability. So, let's start off with the history of the Apple Lisa and the Macintosh XL. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the Apple Lisa or the Macintosh XL, I'm going to go through a bit of the history behind this machine, how it came about um, and how it relates to the Macintosh. So the whole story started um, back in the late 70s when Apple were working on the development of their first computer to use a graphical user interface. Um, because at the time, all they had was the Apple II series, um, such as the II, uh, the II Plus and the IIe, which of course had a text interface. So, but by the late 70s, Apple was convinced that a graphical user interface would be the way of the future and of course well history has shown that to be <laughs> absolutely correct so they started development on their first computer to utilize a graphical user interface which was called the Apple Lisa and there are various theories as to why it was called the Lisa um, I think some people believe it's an acronym I think for um, logical integrated system architecture or something something like that. Some people think it's an acronym, some people think it's, a, it's, it's the name of a person. But it was called the Apple Lisa. And the original Apple Lisa, which looks a little bit different to this, was launched by Apple in 1983. So remember that this was before the Macintosh came out. The Macintosh was not around. The Lisa actually was the first computer by Apple to use a graphical interface. Um, a lot of people assumed it was the Macintosh, but it wasn't. The Lisa actually came first. And the Lisa had its own special graphical environment. So the problems really started when the Lisa was released in terms of the speed, the price, and the applications that came with it. Number one, when the machine was launched in 1983, it cost all of about 10,000 US dollars, which at the time was, well, <laughs> it was a lot now, and it was certainly a, a, lot, a lot back then. The second problem was the speed of the machine. The Lisa used a Motorola 68000 CPU 
just like the original Macintosh did, but it was clocked at 5 megahertz rather than 8. And I believe it also shared the issue of the original Macintosh where the video memory was shared with the system memory. So the CPU had to dedicate clock cycles to video access and then to um, access for the CPU itself. And that slowed things down as well. So when using the Lisa, it wasn't very fast. It was quite sluggish. Um, in fact, the original Macintosh was noticeably faster, in fact, even though the clock speed was only slightly higher. So that was the next problem. And the, the third issue was that there weren't many applications available for the Lisa. You had a basic set of Office applications. It was really the, the predecessor to Microsoft Office in that you had applications such as um, Lisa Calc, Spreadsheet, Lisa Write, a word processor, um, Lisa Draw, Drawing Package, uh, there was Lisa List, I think, which was a database, if I remember. Um, Lisa Project, a project management program. And there were a few other things. I believe there was also a Pascal programming language for it as well. Um, but that was about it. And the issue they faced was, in a sense, this, a similar issue that they faced with the Macintosh when it first came out, which was people won't write applications for a particular platform until there was a large installed base of that platform in existence, and a lot of people have them. And yet, people won't buy these machines if there aren't enough programs out there to fulfill their needs. So they were, in a sense, they were sort of stuck. And so the Lisa One, when it came out, um, was, was, not, was not really a, a big seller, not at all. And I think Apple realized this fairly quickly. So when the, just after the Lisa first came out, um, Apple realized that they, they, they were on the right track with a graphical interface, but they needed to produce something that was a little bit cheaper and a little bit more accessible. And then development started on the Macintosh, which was released in January of 1984. But Apple continued making the Lisa version 1. Now, at this point, I should probably talk about the differences between the various versions of the Apple Lisa. Now, the Lisa 1 looks a little bit different to this. Um, I'll put a photo in the video so that you can see what it looks like. But the Lisa version 1 had a different front panel and it had different floppy drives. It used a special type of floppy drive um, that used, I believe it was five and a quarter inch disks, but they actually had a cutout on each side of the disk for the read-write head. Now, these disks were very unreliable and so Apple very quickly realized they needed to, uh, to change the disk drive system and find something that, that worked a bit, little bit better. So in January of 1984, um, alongside the original Macintosh, the Lisa version 2, or Lisa 2, was released, which looks like this. So they made a few changes. They had, <clears throat> they had changed the floppy drives from the original five and a quarter inch drives to a single 400K, three and a half inch floppy, just like what the Macintosh used. And front panel was changed, and that was, that was really about it. Um, that's, that was the change. But crucially, what Apple did was when the Lisa 2 was released, anyone who owned a Lisa version 1 was entitled to a free upgrade. So if you had bought a Lisa version 1 for you know, $10,000, when the Lisa 2 was released, you could take your machine back to Apple and they would upgrade it for you to a Lisa version 2. And that involved, of course, changing the disk drives and changing the front panel and a few other small changes inside. But as a consequence of that, Lisa version, version 1 leases are pretty hard to come by. Um, and those that are around are certainly uh, very highly prized. Um, but in a sense, the Lisa 2 is actually a more useful version because it has the updated floppy drives. So anyhow, back to the, back to the history. By the time the Lisa 2 had been released in 1984, there were still no extra applications available for the Apple Lisa. It was such a poor seller um, in 1983 that, <clears throat> that Apple 
never really bothered to produce any more applications for it. They did update the what was known as the Lisa Office system, which was the bundled applications such as the word processor and database and and uh, graphing program and spreadsheet, but nothing new came out of it. So the Lisa had relatively limited had a relatively limited appeal, shall we say. But Apple then decided in 1984, because the Macintosh had been such a great sales success, they thought, well, we should, be, we should write some software that allows the Lisa to run Macintosh software. And they did. And in mid-1984, they came out with a program called Macworks. Now, Macworks was a Lisa application that emulated a Macintosh, at the time, a Macintosh 512K. And so you could then use your Apple Lisa to run most of the Macintosh software that was out there. And so it made the Lisa far more useful. And this proved to be quite popular. And so in 1985, January 1985, the Lisa was actually rebranded as the Macintosh XL and came bundled with the MacWorks program. So what you in effect had was an Apple Lisa configured from the factory to run as a Macintosh. And that's how this machine is configured. So the Macintosh XL basically was a last ditch attempt by Apple to, to make the Lisa more useful. The problem was by 1985 they had basically stopped building the Lisa and they more or less used up any inventory to build as many machines as they could up until later in 1985, I think it was in about um, um, April or August 1985, when they discontinued the Macintosh XL for good. So, in that sense, this model of Macintosh technically was on the market for only for about four to five months. <laughs> and it's also worth noting that this is the only model of Macintosh that I know of that does not have the model name anywhere on it. It does not say Macintosh Excel anywhere on the case. But when we do the tour, um, I'll, I'll point that out. So, that's really the history of the... Um, the early history of the Apple Lisa and of the Macintosh XL. But there was another part to this, as in what happened to the Lisa after Apple had discontinued it. So, in 1985, the Macintosh XL was discontinued, and everyone was using Apple Macintoshes then. Uh, the Mac um, 512K had come out and was very popular. So, Apple thought, well, that's it. People can... If they've got an Apple Lisa like this, they can use it as a Macintosh, and that's fine. But what happened is that Apple never really updated the MacWorks software to take advantage of newer system software that was available for the Macintosh. So, enter a company called Sun Remarketing that was based in the American state of, I think it was Utah, if I remember correctly. Sunry Marketing basically bought out a lot of the old stock from Apple with regards to the Lisa. They bought out a lot of the um, complete machines that Apple had not managed to sell. They bought a lot of spare parts and various other things. <clears throat> and they continued to support the Apple Lisa for many years after it was discontinued, right up, on, right up until the mid-1990s, in fact. And Sun Remarketing created many different upgrades for the Lisa. Um, CPU upgrades, memory upgrades, hard drive upgrades, which will be the subject of another video. But they also updated the MacWorks software um, to support newer features that newer model Macintoshes had, such as newer versions of the system software, um, high capacity floppy drives, um, etc, etc, etc. But in one sense, the Apple Lisa was still nothing more than a Macintosh Plus that had a larger screen. It was actually a slightly slower Macintosh Plus, in fact, because the CPU wasn't as fast. But even so, there was quite a lot of um, 
there were quite a few peripherals available for it. And most people then who had Apple leases used them as Macintoshes because there was so much more software available for them. So the final part of the history of the Apple Lisa was it's actually quite a sad um, ending in that by the late 1980s, Sunry Marketing um, had in their inventory, um, I believe several, well, probably at least a thousand, probably more, Apple leases, just like this one, that they had not managed to sell. And that was mainly because um, in the late 80s, why would you buy an Apple Lisa with a, or, an, or a Macintosh XL with, a, with only a five megahertz 68,000 when you could buy a, say a Macintosh SE or SE30 with a faster CPU, larger hard disk, um, the ability to access more memory, um, and, and quite a few other improvements. And it was a lot smaller and lighter as well. Although the screen wasn't as large, but it was, it was obviously a machine that people preferred. So for reasons that still probably aren't clear, I believe it was due to uh, um, tax reasons, um, not sure, but Sunry Marking decided <clears throat> rather than sell off their inventory at a bargain basement price, they decided to dump them. And so what happened was they basically took all of their remaining Apple leases and all the parts and everything else, I believe, and literally buried them in a local landfill. Uh, this happened, I think, in 1989. And that was it. <laughs> It's, it's strange that if those, if those machines had been sold, um, then, well, they'd be, they'd be probably easier to find, but they may not have been worth as much, admittedly. Um, <clears throat> but that's what they did. And it's, it's quite a shame, really, because um, parts for Apple leases these days, very, very hard to come by, as are the complete machines. Um, mainly because they share very few components with any model of Macintosh. Because remember that the Lisa was designed before the Macintosh was even released. But that's just how it is. So that's basically the story or the history of the Apple Lisa and the Macintosh XL. Um, so in the next video, we're going to have a closer look at this Apple Lisa, aka Macintosh XL. Have a good look at it. Um, look at the outside, look at the inside, and we'll do a um, disassembly of the machine so we can see how it's put together. So, thank you for watching.